to all those who devoted their lives to aviation. The Wings of Russia Studio presents Wings of Russia documentary. Every summer, news agencies report of forest fires bursting out in this or that country. Fire brings enormous damage. That's where fire extinguishing aviation can help. An airplane looks like a tiny bug against environment. Can it really help? Efficiency of the fire extinguishing aircraft becomes the main point how much fire extinguishing liquid it can take and how quick. A hydroplane has no match in this situation. Gliding over the water surface within seconds, it fills up the tanks to drop tons of water on the fire source. Hydroplanes today are used mainly at emergency situations. But throughout their history, they fought in wars, transported passengers, rescued people, and performed many other things. Hydroplanes, the steel albatross. Russia, beginning of the 20th century. Flights of the first airplanes gather thousands of fascinated spectators. Aviation becomes extremely popular. Too bad that there were not enough runways for the air stacks to take off and land. A thought of using calm water surface for takeoff seems absolutely natural. It's that easy just to make a floating out of a ground-based airplane. First probes were not much intricate. Instead of a wheeled landing gear, there were floats. But it wasn't that easy. For an airplane of this kind, the most important thing is its seaworthiness, the ability to be stable on water. In search of an optimum form, the floats were extended. Gradually, a thought came to turn fuselage into a boat. Thus, two types of hydroplanes were established for a long-term perspective. One with a float-type landing gear, the other flying boats. The first was good thanks to easy change of floats to wheels for the airplane to take off from the ground. The other, as compared with the first, had excellent seaworthiness. From the very start, harder planes had a specific problem. At takeoff, Airplanes did not want to unstick from the water surface as if it was holding them. The way out was found in the planning step, which helped significantly the hydroplane to unstick. One of the main tasks was resolved. By 1912, the number of hydroplanes amounted to dozens. Most successful companies were the American Curtis, the French Newport, and the British Roy. Hydra aviation in Russia seemed to have good perspective. The country is washed by seas from all sides with a lot of internal calm and plain rivers. Starting with copying foreign samples, Russian designers quickly turned to creation of their own model. The first Russian Hydro airplane was made by Yakov Gakke. In 1911, he demonstrated his aircraft at an aviation show in St. Petersburg. Although the airplane did not take off at all. The first flight of the Russian S-5 ground-based floating gear hydroplane took place two years later. 
it was built by Igor Sikorsky. His next hydroplane, S-10, became the first Russian hydro aircraft put into production. The Army expressed interest to such aircraft, identifying them as an efficient reconnaissance instrument. But still, only seven of S-10 were purchased. Army commanders preferred to buy hydroplanes abroad. Domestic designers, in their opinion, did not deserve enough respect. The situation changed by 1915. Russia became the leader in hydroplane development among other countries. This happened thanks to efforts of the Russian aircraft designer Dmitry Grigorovich. He gained experience working on the flying boats and in spring 1915 M5, the first successful sample of his own, appeared. The Navy purchased around 300 machines. Grigorovich continued his experiments. Half a year after his first aircraft, there appeared M9, another successful flying boat. It was larger and had a more powerful engine. Its flight and seaworthiness characteristics were improved. M9 could be used even at a sea of over half a meter. Both M5 and M9 successfully participated in the First World War. A lot of them were used in the Baltic and the Black Seas. High demand for his production turned Grigorovich into an aircraft producing factory owner. Other designers offered their hydroplanes to the Russian Navy as well. Even a special station for testing the aircraft entering military service was established. The situation radically changed after the October Revolution of 1917. All factories were nationalized, the industry was in a quick downswing. After the Civil War and intervention, the country leadership pursued the path toward militarization. Among other weapons, the country needed aircraft. But the country was in decay and since it was unrealistic to arrange its own production, the country started to buy aircraft abroad. The most close commercial relations were established with the Italians and Germans. After losing the First World War, Germany was prohibited making military aircraft, so it made them as civil airplanes. Armament was being put in place afterwards, already in Russia. In the 20s, the Red Army Air Force put on service the float-type Junkers aircraft, the U-20 reconnaissance planes, and the three-engine UG-1 bombers. Those machines were used as civil airplanes as well. Besides, U-13 and its transport version V-33 were used for passenger air routes. But the most mass of the purchased was the Dornier Val flying boat. The first aircraft arrived in the Soviet Union in 1926. This solid and reliable machine served well in the naval aviation and the Arctic research. The powerful flying boat starts for the Arctic journey. It is piloted by the polar pilot Sirakvasha. It was an advanced aircraft for its time. All metal monoplane had a flat bottom enabling it to take off not only from water but from snow and ice. The flying boat will perform ice reconnaissance in the western sector of the Kara Sea. Such choice was not incidental. The Dornier's Val flying boat was very reliable at flying into the open sea. Such characteristics was very important for hydroplanes. 
The polar explorer Roar Amundsen chose this particular aircraft for his flight to the North Pole. Italian hydroplanes found their application in the USSR in various spheres as well. The three-seat Savoia S-16 flying boat was used as a reconnaissance aircraft. A whole crowd used to take it to water with the help of a wheeled cart, the so-called rollover chassis. The aircraft was taken to seaplane ramp, put on water, the chassis was detached and the boat took off. The next Savoia S-62 also served as a close-range reconnaissance aircraft. The twin fuselage Savoia S-55 flying boat arrived in the Soviet Union in a small number. This 12-seat aircraft operated at passenger airlines of the Pacific coast. Thus, by mid-twenties, hydroaviation of this country began to resurrect. This process was not entirely based on purchasing foreign aircraft. Attempts were made to design local machines. The first successful ground-based airplane was put on floats. It was MR-1 designed by Nikolai Polikarpov. It was put on service as a marine reconnaissance aircraft. A special MU-1 machine was made to train how to fly hydroplanes. It was also a ground-based airplane. Airplanes could base on ships as well. In this case, they were put on water by cranes. Everything seemed so simple. Just take a ground-based airplane and put it on floats. However, there were no locally made floats and their construction turned out to be extremely difficult. First, the floats were coming from abroad. Then designers started to copy the foreign samples. Finally, production of the British floats was set up in Russia. They were put on TB-1 and R-6 airplanes designed by Andrei Tupolev. Unit Commander Comrade Kuznetsov, recently awarded with the Order of Lenin, distributed the current reconnaissance task. This hydro reconnaissance unit is one of the best. In 1923, Dmitry Grigorovich was back designing the flying boats. Just a while ago, in the First World War, his airplanes were the pride of the Russian sea-based aviation. Now he was back in business. Grigorovich tried to bring his prior layouts to life. This time, roughly manufactured, they were a parody to the successful pre-revolution M5 and M9 machines. Later on, he designed several more hydroplanes but he could not reach his prior success. In 1928, the Soviet government, having no reliance on the local engineers, invited those from France, headed by Paul Richard. Most of the French could not work under the offered conditions and soon left the USSR without producing a single machine. In 1931, Paul Richard also left the country. We remember him only because he headed a group in which many future Soviet designers made their first steps in aviation. Nikolai Kamov, Mikhail Gurevich, Georgi Biriev, Igor Chitverikov, Semyon Labachkin, Nikolai Skrzynski, Vadim Shavrov, Sergei Karolev. Later, some of them took great interest in hydroplanes. In the 30s, there were already numerous hydroplane projects, but only several of them were successful. Among them was the MBR-2 close-range reconnaissance aircraft designed by Georgi Biriev. Comprehensive research work was performed in the creation of the new aircraft. 
By that time, this work was completely based upon the Central Air Hydrodynamic Institute. The aircraft testing was conducted in wind tunnels, while the boat fuselage was tested in a water channel. It was the first significant step in the development of the Soviet Hydra airplane. The aircraft first took off in April 1932. Its speed and range were not at all outstanding, but it was a good machine for its time. Most important was the use of wood, which was in abundance, enabling to develop mass production. Besides reconnaissance, this aircraft could perform bombing of the targets detected at sea. A lot of aircraft identified as MP-1 went to service in civil aviation. The Irkutsk Hydra Airport is the main base for the air connection with Yakutia. From there, comfortable passenger MP-1 airplanes daily start their long journey. Passengers of all ages are on board. Aviation has long become an ordinary means of transport for this country. It takes 15 to 20 days for a ship to reach Yakutsk. A hydroplane covers the same route within 12 hours. Here is Yakutsk. The flight is over. The light SHA-2, designed by Vadim Shavrov, was also a mass product. It was an amphibian aircraft, which could be used from both water and ground. It had a standard wheel landing gear. Due to its minor dimensions, SHA-2 could not be used at sea. It did not interest the army either. Nevertheless, the Shavrov's amphibian was a very popular machine. It was used in the air schools and air clubs, worked at passenger hydro airlines, performed ice and fishing reconnaissance. Its popularity could only be compared with the Polycarpus U-2, the most renowned training aircraft of that time. SHA-2 flew until 1964 when the sky for long was occupied by jet aviation. A couple of words about unusual projects implemented in the 30s. A folding mini-flying boat for submarines was proposed by Igor Chitvirikov. He basically repeated the British with their similar experiments. Chitvirikov's aircraft was called SPL. It was too fragile to be used at sea. There was also an exotic project a suspended torpedo-carrying sea glider PSN. It was supposed to be dropped from a heavy bomber, approach the target, torpedo it, and then land on water. But this idea did not come true. The 30s in the USSR were the years of a great industrial recovery and development of the largest army in the world. According to enormous plans, the Air Force was being equipped with new bombers and fighters. But things with the sea aviation were not as good. Its doctrine was indistinct. Therefore, there were no orders for the new machines. All this made a negative impact on the prospective sea aircraft development. Several design bureaus were involved in this work, but the military command was not satisfied with the result. Even Andrei Tupolev, by that time a respectable designer, did not succeed in developing flying boats. His first hydroplane was ANT-8, which development was not finished due to Tupolev's workload. 
then there was a six-engine ANT-22, a gigantic long-range bomber and reconnaissance aircraft carrying six tons of bombs. Its speed was insufficient. The next was ANT-27 reconnaissance torpedo carrier. And finally, ANT-44, the most successful flying boat made right before the war, just in two copies. Not long before the war, there appeared minor reconnaissance aircraft meant to be ship-based. They were developed by the Beriev Design Bureau. The prototype for these machines was the bought in Germany Heinkel ship-based reconnaissance aircraft. In the USSR it operated under the name KR-1. The German aircraft did not have any outstanding flight characteristics, but it allowed to establish cooperation between a ship and an aircraft. In 1935, the Beriev Design Bureau made a number of catapulting KOR-1 ship-based reconnaissance aircraft. Due to their small size, these machines had poor seaworthiness, and soon all of them were found on shore where they were put on wheel landing gear. The same happened to the next Beriev ship-based reconnaissance aircraft, KOR-2. It was meant to be based on battleships, but such ships were not built and the aircraft remained on the sidelines. By mid-30s, the speed factor became decisive in the world aircraft development. Machines with bulky floats started gradually to quit the scene. The future was seen with the flying boats which were more advanced from the point of view of aerodynamics. Designers did not succeed in making a flying boat of their own, of a relevant quality and in the required quantity. So the country's leadership took the usual path by purchasing such machines abroad. This time American aircraft were preferred. The four-engine Glenn Martin 156 flying boat was built upon the Soviet order. Initially, it was meant for the military use. But the speed was insufficient and the giant was passed over to the civil aviation. The other passenger flying boat even got into a popular Soviet pre-war comedy film Volga Volga. It was Igor Sikorsky's S-43. There was also Douglas DF. Passengers were accommodated in four compartments. Soft armchairs could be transformed into couches. Airplanes were attached to the Polar Aviation. All these machines were bought in single copies, while the most mass in America was a flying boat of the Consolidated Company. It was being produced in the USSR since 1938 under the definition GST transport hydroplane, but it was equipped with Soviet engines. The USSR N-275 flying boat is delivered to the Himki Reservoir. This flying boat was part of the Polar Aviation while the Himki Reservoir in the north of Moscow in those years was its base. The aircraft commander, polar pilot Cherevichny, navigator Akuratov, radio operator Makarov, navigator assistant Nevzovtsev, and other members of the group are starting to Arctic. They will perform ice reconnaissance in the Laptivik Sea and the Eastern Siberian Sea. By the 40s, the Soviet hydroaviation consisted of dozens of different types of flying boats of the Soviet and foreign design. And while they suited the civil aviation quite well, those machines were hopelessly outdated for the military purposes. The most popular MBR-2 close-range sea reconnaissance aircraft was outdated long ago. 
while the Che-2 long-range reconnaissance plane of Igor Chetverikov was built for service in a small quantity. That's how the Soviet hydro aviation entered the war with Germany. However, there wasn't much work for it in the waters adjacent to the Soviet Union. The sea aviation was regarded as a supplement to the Navy. But the latter in the Baltic Sea was blocked in the Gulf of Finland. While in the Black Sea and the Northern Seas, its combat efforts were not strong. The flying boats mostly performed reconnaissance tasks, search and rescue of the shutdown crews. There were only occasional chances of detecting and attacking a German submarine. An enemy submarine is right on board. It attempts to submerge. Too late. The anti-submarine bombs are off. The operator sends a message to the base. Enemy submarine attacked in square 4314. At the same time, sea combat actions of a radically different scale and effect took place far away from the USSR. Most of the German submarines were hunting in the broad expanse of the Atlantic. Convoys were going continuously from America to England. In turn, the German submarines were hunted by hundreds of British and American anti-submarine aircraft. No less actively, hydroaviation was used in the Pacific Ocean, where in December 1941, USA and Japan entered into confrontation. The combat specifics was such that the sea aviation played the decisive role. Therefore, the naval aviation on both sides had huge quantities and different types of hydroplanes. With such hydro aviation blossom, the Second World War was the start of its decline. Those aircraft were famous for their range, flight duration and reliability. However, by 1943, land-based aircraft had the same characteristics. Gradually, they picked up performance of reconnaissance tasks, torpedo attacks, mine setting, and anti-submarine functions, leaving flying boats with their ditching ability only to search and rescue. In 1943, the USSR obtained a chance to enforce its naval aviation. Allies started to provide help. Among other things, coming through the Lend-Lease program, there came flying boats. Those were new modifications of the same American flying boats which were built in the USSR before the war. The aircraft was called Catalina. It had several versions, including amphibians. It was the right choice. Catalina was really one of the best flying boats of the Second World War and had the largest circulation in its class, 3,300 copies. Not long before Catalina deliveries, USSR started development of its own flying boat. The long-range reconnaissance aircraft was designed by Georgi Biriev's bureau. It was called LL-143, which stood for the first flying boat of 1943. The layout was well thought. Numerous tests were carried out, including those in the Tsagi Water Channel. Water sprays hit the winding propeller like bullets. 
in order to protect it, the engines were put on a high wing, which was kicked in a so-called seagull mode, and the engines were put right in the kink. Thus, the engines were at maximum remoteness from the water. Viability was assured by the fuselage separation into sections with waterproof partitions, just like the vessels had. For defense, the aircraft had several firing points. For better seaworthiness, the bottom was made with two planning steps. The aircraft was stable at gliding, although there were purposing, such was the sea aviation term defining the aircraft jumping after the first touchdown. LL-143 performed its first flight in March 1945. Then there were difficulties with the new engine supply. They were first supposed to be put on the more important TU-4 bomber. The flying boat was commissioned only in 1951 under the name of BE-6. As compared to the wartime flying boats, BE-6 was way more capable. Payload 4 tons, range 5,000 kilometers, 20 hours of non-stop flight. Its main tasks were reconnaissance and anti-submarine duties. Downwards you see anti-submarine locator beacons. Each BE-6 can set up to 16 such beacons in one flight. One aircraft can make a 32-mile long beacon barrier. Combined search of submarines by ships and aircraft with the use of locator beacons proved its high efficiency. Besides, BE-6 can perform 24-hour rescue operations at sea. The aircraft was not at all simple in operation. Before the flight, mechanics had to detach the rollover chassis. It was all right for the south, but BE-6 was serving in the north as well. After the flight, all operations had to be performed in reverse order. Also, this huge machine had to be washed with fresh water to remove salt. State defense was not an easy task. In spite the tension brought by the Cold War, Bereev's design bureau proposed a pure peaceful machine, the BE-8 Amphibian. It had unusual chassis in the form of underwater wings. Speaking of experiments, we should mention the Hercules flying boat built by Howard Hughes, an American millionaire. This 200-ton giant had eight engines and almost 100-meter wingspan. But it made only one flight at a range of less than one kilometer. In the second half of the 40s, land-based jet engine aircraft mastered high speed. The rush for speed involved hydro aviation as well. The principally new engine opened unlimited capabilities. Georgi Beriev fell to temptation. By that time, he was practically the only designer left in the USSR who was making hydro airplanes. After the war, his design bureau was based in Taganrog, where a jet engine R-1 reconnaissance flying boat was made in 1948. High flying speed resulted in high speed at takeoff and landing. The aircraft water touchdown turned into a crazy race with the out-of-limit G-loads. This was bad for both the layout and the crew. Okay. 
So the first Berif's jet experience was not very successful. But this did not stop the Naval Command's desire to have a high-speed jet-flying boat at their disposal. In 1953, Berif was assigned to make even a bigger and more capable machine. It was called the BE-10. Its size was significant. The bigger the flying boat was, the more stable on water it would be. The flight and combat characteristics increase was dictated by the new conditions where the enemy did not stay still. The BE-10 layout was different from that of R-1. A swept wing, engines placed close to fuselage. This gave certain aerodynamic advantages, but it led to higher vibration. At one of the tests, this resulted in destruction of the prototype's tail. BE-10 jet flying boats went into production and in 1959 they entered military service. BE-10 could carry bombs, torpedoes and mines. Several BE-10 were shown at air parades in Moscow and Leningrad as a symbol of Soviet achievements. Soon there came a new important task, record setting. The hydroplane was now identified as M-10. In September, M-10 was prepared for world record setting in payload, altitude and speed. This time the task was assigned to test pilot Georgi Buryanov, navigator Vladimir Bogoc and operator Viktor Peribailov. The date of the first flight was September 3, 1961. Additional cargo is loaded and sealed. Controls are installed and sealed by the sports commissioner. Chief designer Georgi Beriev gives instructions to the crew. In result of a set of flights, the M-10 Hydra airplane set 12 world records. So long for the records, now back to operation, which was not easy. Takeoff and landing at high wave led to high G-loads. The hand wheel was shaking, controls were hardly visible. Flights were often suspended. There were accidents and catastrophes. The price for high speed was very high. Four years after the start, BE-10 flights were terminated. Interesting to say that a similar Jet Sea Master flying boat was developed overseas by the Martin Company. It faced absolutely the same problems. Americans quickly realized that the idea was not perspective and stopped the works after making only three machines. While BE-10 was being slowly brought to combat conditions, the military command was planning to create an ocean aviation. The task was to make a supersonic hydroplane with an intercontinental reconnaissance and bomber capacity. In the event of ground aerodrome's destruction, such flying boats would be able to provide for the retaliation. The assignment was given to the most respectable designers Tupolev, Mesishev and Beriev. But the task was so far from reality that the works never started. The United States also tried to make a supersonic flying boat. It was called the Sea Dart and had a small size. But the technical complexity of the task was so big that the project ended up at a test stage. The West was gradually putting flying boats aside. 
first, because of their high operational costs, secondly, because their combat tasks could well be performed by other means. The Soviet Union had a different approach. The flying boats attracted by survivability of their hydro air drones. No less important was their direct contact with the ships at sea for refueling and ammunition supply. An event happened in 1960 led to revolutionary changes in the sea war strategy. The United States commissioned their first nuclear submarine with ballistic missiles on board. Their range was thousands of kilometers. Search and interception of such a submarine became practically useless. But still something was supposed to be done. Tactical and strategic plans were reconsidered. Development of the relevant means and aircraft in particular was planned. That's how the interception line idea appeared. At the worldwide ocean lines, the NATO submarines were supposed to be found by the TU-95 ARTSE reconnaissance designators, while at mid-range lines by the anti-submarine IL-38 and BE-12. While TU-95 and IL-38 were coast-based aircraft, BE-12 represented a new generation of amphibians. Their wing had the classical seagull shape with the engine's maximum remoteness from water. Tests showed BE-12 complete superiority over BE-6 in all parameters. Amphibiousness made the aircraft independent of any season. It was more capable of performing the main task, submarine search and destruction. For this purpose, the aircraft could carry bombs, self-homing torpedoes, and even tactical nuclear charges. Dozens of radio beacons and other special equipment were used for detection. Each beacon cost like a passenger car, therefore air units were short of their application. The search equipment located in the long nose and the same kind of a long tail gave the aircraft an unusual look. The non-sea pilots joked about BE-12. Is it a nose or a tail? It depends on the task, the sea pilots joked back. Training at the naval aviation units was intense. Same things day after day. Training, theory, weapons application, continuous combat duties, a routine. A different thing was a real target detection, track down and its radar lock-on. A real hunter's excitement. Training, which took place every year until the end of the 80s, tested the acquired skills. BE-14, a special BE-12-based modification, was built for search and rescue operations. It differed from the base aircraft by more wider hatches to take in the victims. But it remained a single copy. Rescue functions were performed by several specially refurbished BE-12. One of such amphibians was successfully used to deliver emergency cargoes in October 1993 during the disastrous earthquake at the Kurils.
a fire extinguishing modification of BE-12 appeared in 1991. The 4,500-liter tanks are filled within 15 seconds at which the flying boat glides over the water surface. In 1983, the Brief Design Bureau obtained a new task. An ocean amphibian with a much larger range than of BE-12 was supposed to be made for the anti-submarine defense. The new jet hydroplane was called A-40 and later the Albatross. The first rollout and the traditional bottle of champagne. The first takeoff from the ground. The first takeoff from water. The A40 dimensions allowed it to be used in the oceans at waves of up to 2 meters. The power plant was rather unusual. It consisted of two visible cruising engines of 12 tons thrust each and two hidden booster engines of 3 tons thrust each working only at takeoff. Long-term patrolling was provided by an in-flight refueling system. By the time of its first flight in December 1986, the country entered a difficult economic period, leaving Albatross with no customers. It did not perform any combat task, but surprised the world continuously by setting 138 world records in altitude, speed and payload. The amphibian never found its military application, although its layout initially contained multi-purpose capabilities. Different versions of this aircraft were offered under new economic conditions. Rescue cargo passenger, fire extinguishing. In order to promote this and other Bereaves aircraft, the first hydro aviation salon took place in Gelenjik at the Black Sea in September 1996, which has become a regular event. Unfortunately, the aircraft did not find demand neither in this country nor abroad. Since the Ocean Range A-40 was no more actual, the Bereave Design Bureau developed a new aircraft based on the same successful layout, but of minor size and weight. It was called BE-200. This amphibian made its first flight in September 1998. It has a cargo and passenger variant with the possibility to perform rescue operations. But the main and currently most demanded application of this amphibian is the forest fire fighting. The fire extinguishing BE-200 is three times more efficient than BE-12. Its productivity is twice higher than that of the world most renowned Canadian CL-415 fire extinguishing airplane. No doubt that BE-200 was assigned to serve for the emergency ministry and it already took part in real operations. In the recent years, Russia had not been actively developing new aircraft. At least there were no more global projects. However, newly born freedom gave way to a lot of enthusiasts. Minor hydroplanes of various layouts were present at both large and small air exhibitions. 
The good thing is that these self-made machines are not only shown at exhibitions, but really and actively operate. In 1997, the Bereev Design Bureau proposed a minor civil amphibian BE-103. It was made upon an interesting layout. Its wing was semi-submerged, acting as a screen at takeoff. Demand for hydroaviation makes no doubt. There is no doubt that the Russian aircraft designers are among the leaders in this sphere. Let us hope that this potential will be implemented.